um, the, you know, there's this attack on public education from the from the state and from um, and from corporations. Right now, we're in the situation where there were two schools in Durham that were that were chosen to be um, that were targeted to for a charter school takeover because of being low performing schools. One was Lakewood Elementary, which has now been removed from the list. That's very close to my house, and another is Glen Elementary, which is still on the list. And it's the intention of the state to take one of these schools and turn it over to a private charter operator, um, basically, you know, to, to under the idea that this, you know, this private outsourcing, this private um, profit-driven model will do, will somehow do better for our kids than, than a public model, which um, there's no evidence for that. And in fact, these sort of, these sort of charter school takeovers have actually produced um, have produced lower student achievement results in cities like New Orleans and Chicago and Philadelphia. We've seen, you know, plenty of evidence that these charter school takeovers don't work. But because, you know, there there's so much money behind it, there's so much profit motive behind these charter school operators. Um, and because, you know, the folks in the General Assembly right now just don't actually believe in public goods, we are in a situation where, you know, we're we're looking at, you know, one of our schools being forcibly ripped from our district. Um, and and outsourced for profit, um, which is which is just terrifying. There's this new mandate that's coming down the pike for for 20 students or less um, in grades K through three um, that the General Assembly has decided that all K through three classrooms have to have 20 students or less. But there's there's no money, right? There's there's no funding attached to this mandate. So Wake County. Um, has said that in order to actually meet this mandate, it would they would have to open 14 new elementary schools to manage, you know, the number of students because their classrooms almost almost exclusively have more than 20 students. They don't have the money to have those small class sizes. Everyone would love small class sizes, but that means you have to actually fund education. And when you've spent the last, you know, eight years cutting taxes on the rich and cutting funding, you know, and per per pupil spending is one of the lowest, you know, at one of the lowest rates in the country, you can't have, you know, 20 students in a classroom and also have one of the lowest per, per pupil spending rates in the country. And I think, you know, I think the goal I think is, is clear is to, to set conditions on the ground such that public schools fail, then blame them for failing, and then outsource them to private corporations. And that's what we're seeing, you know, that's, that's kind of what we're seeing happen um, both with this, you know, this class size mandate and with this charter school takeover in Durham, it's really scary. And you know, as a parent who has who has children in public schools, I find it, I find it really frustrating. And I'm not even, I'm not even honestly worried about my own children. You know, I, I'm a, you know, my family is middle class, and we have the, you know, the resources and the capacity to make sure that our children, you know, have get what they need academically. Um, But there are a lot of families, you know, in this city, in this community, where the parents work, you know, where the parents don't have flexible jobs. If my kid gets sick, I can call, you know, I can go pick him up. There are lots of people in this community who don't have that privilege, you know, who, who are very much, you know, struggling just to make it, just to make it through the week. And we owe it to them and we owe it to their children to have a public school system um, a public school system that works, and I think that it's becoming increasingly harder with these these escalating attacks from the state um, to make that happen. And so I think that the situation, you know, I think that it, it's it's definitely it's definitely troubling. But I believe that there, you know, that there are there are people in this community who want to make sure that our schools succeed. We have an incredibly um, strong and active teachers union, the Durham Association of Educators. Um, we have, you know, principals and, and administrators who really care about our kids and are dedicated to, you know, to making sure that they succeed academically, socially, you know, making sure that we continue to have, to have arts programs in schools, that we're really educating whole people and not just, you know, relying on, on test scores and this idea of academic achievement as the only as the only metric that we use to measure to measure growth and to measure, you know, how our how our kids are doing. So um, yeah, I mean I think education is in a really is in a really tricky place, but I'm glad that we have so many people in our community who are who are dedicated and who are working on this issue. There's been a huge community fight back against this this charter school takeover. 
and it's going to continue until they until they back off. Yeah, definitely think that you're right about that. Um, now, one of the other issues that I know we talked about earlier on the show, and you mentioned Charlottesville, and Durham is definitely at the forefront of it, but the whole thing of the Confederate Monument. So I was wondering what your thoughts are oh, in yeah. terms of how that, <laughs> as to what we should do, how, and the takedown of it, and what we should do with those monuments in general. <laughs> Oh my God! Well, I mean, I think that I <laughs> luckily there are no more Confederate monuments and and you know and public land in the city of Durham or the county of Durham. The one in front of the Durham County Courthouse was the only one. Um, and I think you know I agree I agree with the with the activists and with Governor Cooper that these monuments have no no place in in public space. I think it's entirely reasonable for them to be in at historical sites at you know battlefields and museums, et cetera. But, you know, the idea that we would continue to to venerate these, you know, these so-called heroes who were actively, you know, actively fighting for a white supremacist slavery, you know, pro-slavery agenda, um, I think is is ludicrous and is increasingly, you know, has become increasingly clear that that is ludicrous. I remember, you know, a few years ago when Bree Newsom took down the Confederate flag um, at the South Carolina State House. That that was really you know it was really a watershed moment in thinking about what these symbols mean, um, and has gotten an increasing amount of attention. The flags, the monuments, et cetera, and I think that the you know the tide is turning towards um, towards moving these monuments from these public sites, um, shifting from this idea of veneration to a more neutral you know historical. More, more neutral spaces of just historical study and placement. Um, and, and I, you know, of course there's going to be, there's going to be blowback from that, from people who want this legacy of white supremacy here in the South to continue to be venerated. And that's what, you know, that's what we've seen with these marches in Charlottesville. You know, like I said, before I was born in Charlottesville, I have, you know, I still have family there, cousins and, um, you know, aunts and uncles and, and lots of people that I care about. Um, live in the city and and one of my cousins actually during the during the march um, back in August where you know where Heather Heyer the activist was was murdered by a white supremacist I you know have a cousin who was who was um, posting on social media that she was afraid to leave um, her workplace because there were all of these white supremacists who were like parked in her parking lot outside of the store where she works, like getting ready to go march. Um, and she was afraid to, to go outside. I think that, you know, it's, it's clear that these are, that these marches are acts of racial intimidation, that they should not be considered protected free speech, that marching, you know, um, with explicitly violent um, and, and racially targeted ideology and, 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 using violence against, you know, people in the community. We saw, you know, videos of people being being beaten up in Charlottesville. Uh, uh, you know, white supremacists fired a gun at a crowd of demonstrators. You know, someone ran over someone with their car. Like, this is not protected free speech. And so I think that, you know, there there is, of course, blowback, and, and there's going to be, and we have to be prepared for that. But I, I do think that the conversation – um, has been moving in the right direction, and more and more cities are are taking down are taking down their monuments, moving them to museums or or battlefield sites, which is where they always should have been. You know, I mean, the, the history is coming out now that these monuments weren't put up after the Civil War in order to commemorate Civil War dead. They were put up during Jim Crow and during the Civil Rights era in order to remind you know remind our, us Black folks where where our place is um, to to reinforce white supremacy and to remind us that, you know, every time that we walk into a courthouse or a public building that these institutions were created by white people explicitly in order to oppress us. Um, and I think that that, you know, that history, I'm very glad that that history is being told and I'm very glad that history is being pushed back on. And I think that Durham, you know, has been, has been at the forefront of that and our human relations commission um, through the city is going to be, you know, convening a series of community discussions around this idea, you know, of of how we remember the Civil War. Who are the people that we that we want to remember? You know, what acts are actually acts of heroism? 
that we want to venerate. Um, you know, there were there were people who refused to fight in the Civil War, um, who were conscientious objectors, and some of those folks were murdered for their beliefs, and some of them, you know, were forced into exile. And I think there are so many important stories that we could tell about this period, and you know, I'm I'm excited to to learn more about about those stories of resistance and you know and the the stories that I think should be should be inspiring us um in this era instead of the stories of, of folks who wanted to you know to keep black folks in slavery. Those are not the people who we should be continuing to honor. Oh no, not at all. Now you're talking about blowbacks. Now one of the greatest blowbacks that I remember and I was just wondering what some of your thoughts on this were were um where speaking of H B um H B two and even before that, the whole um amendment thing of trying to give uh and I forgot which field that was, but basically gay rights and everything. And then it became like the marriage whole blowback. Amendment? The marriage amendment, thank you. But it became yeah. like a whole blowback about trying to put the progressive ministerial community against the progressive gay community. So I was just wondering what some of your thoughts were as to how that transpired and how we avoided that to some degree. Because I, I remember being in several discussions with people that they were telling me about their ministers. Some that were progressive, some that were not in, you know, trying to bring the whole biblical sense of what was going on in the whole conversation. Sure. I mean, I think I think that the North Carolina NAACP actually took an incredibly important stand on, on Amendment 1, the so-called marriage amendment, by coming out against it, um, because the NAACP has historically been an organization that has been, you know, very closely tied to the black Christian church. Reverend Barber as the, you know, as the president of the NAACP, as a Christian minister. And so having that very prominent, you know, organization with these, with this very clear Christian connection and Christian roots coming out against Amendment 1, you know, and and very explicitly saying this is discrimination, we don't agree with this, you know, this is not, this is not what our theology says, I think was really critically important for, um, for making it clear that it wasn't, that there were religious organizations who were supportive of, you know, of um, same-sex couples having the same rights as opposite-sex couples, um, you know, under the law in our state. Uh, it's been, you know, there there are churches in Durham who supported Amendment 1. I remember driving around and seeing signs saying, you know, saying vote for the marriage amendment outside outside of these, you know, these more conservative churches. And I think that, you know, after after that passed, I think that there was, you know, there was this period where the, where the, you know, these cases were going through the courts where gay marriage, you know, had always been illegal in North Carolina, but there was this constitutional amendment now kind of cementing it. And then finally, when that was overturned by a court order, um, you know, it, it really, I think it really brought out a lot of, it really brought the community together in a lot of ways and it really exposed some of the, you know, continuing disagreements in the community in other ways. Um, I think that this, it takes a long time for cultural change to happen. Um, A majority of Americans didn't agree with interracial marriage until, what was it, like 1980-something? The majority of, of white folks during civil rights thought that the civil rights marches were hurting the cause um, of black equality. So I, I, you know, it, these shifts take a long time, um, but I I think that it's been it's been important to have you know these really well known and important organizations like the NAACP on the right side. Um, and I'm glad that you know honestly I'm glad that the that the marriage fights are over because I think that there are a lot of issues that folks in the LGBT community face and have faced and continue to face that were really um, subsumed by the whole marriage uh, question and, t- you know, tons and tons of money, millions of dollars and thousands of hours of volunteer energy went into this marriage equality fight. And, and at the same time, you know, we're, there's an epidemic of violence against transgender people right now, and especially transgender women of color are killed at something like eight times the rate of, you know, of other folks in, in, in this country. Um, there is a growing number of, of queer um, young people, teenagers and young adults who are forced to leave their homes. Um, the homelessness rate for LGBTQ folks is much higher than 
for heterosexuals, the suicide rates are much higher. There are all these really important issues that um, 